The European and American public are being systematically lied to about the Ukraine crisis. In this video, we're going to provide you with compelling evidence that the crimes against humanity committed in Kiev earlier this year were in fact committed by the new coalition government, and that officials in the EU and the United States knew full well who committed these crimes, and that they are protecting and financially supporting the real criminals. On February 20th of 2013, the world was shocked by video footage of snipers firing on protesters in Kiev, Ukraine. 21 people were murdered, and it was widely assumed that President Viktor Yanukovych and his supporters were behind the attacks. However, a phone conversation between EU foreign policy chief Kathy Ashton and Estonia's foreign minister Urmas Payet, which was leaked to the public on March 5th, reveals that the snipers were actually from the new coalition government, and that Western diplomats knew this and covered it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that he has some sort of, how to say, trust among all these Maidan people and, and civil society. And second, what was quite disturbing, the same Olga told that, well, all the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that's, yeah. But so that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor. She can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened. So that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers they were. It was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. For some reason, the U.S. media didn't think that that little detail was worth covering. But wait, I thought the opposition protesters were just peaceful activists who wanted a chance to join the European Union. Well, yeah, that's the official narrative that the U.S. media outlets are peddling. But the real story is far more ominous. It turns out that the most powerful and influential contingent in the opposition is a coalition of literal fascists and neo-Nazis. And they aren't peaceful. In fact, they're extremely brutal. The most prominent among these extremist groups is an organization called Svoboda. The Svoboda party, which traces its roots to the Ukrainian partisan party of World War II, was loosely allied with Nazi Germany. Until 2004, Svoboda had been called the Social Nationalist Party, a deliberate reference to the National Socialism of the Nazis. And we're not throwing the term neo-Nazi around here as an empty slur. The leader of Svoboda, Oli Tanibok, has openly targeted Jews and ethnic Russians in Ukraine for many years. In 2004, he was kicked out of Viktor Yushchenko's government for a speech calling for Ukrainians to fight against a, quote, Muscovite Jewish Mafia. And in 2005, he signed his name to an open letter to the leadership of Ukraine entitled, Stop the Criminal Activities of Organized Jewry. And none of this was a secret. The BBC was already reporting on the danger that Svoboda's rise posed back in 2012. And the EU passed a resolution that same year condemning Svoboda as, quote, racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic. Yet somehow the U.S. government thought it was appropriate to back these extremists. This is a picture of Victoria Nuland from the U.S. State Department meeting with Ole Tanibok in February. And this is a picture of Senator John McCain sharing a stage with Tanibok in December. But why would the U.S. government work with neo-Nazis? Because they thought that they could control the situation. They thought that they could install their puppets behind the scenes and manipulate the situation in their favor. That same Victoria Nuland who met with Svoboda in February was caught on another leaked call discussing who they would put in power. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um... The, the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now, so we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, 
I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk, It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. The mainstream media tried to draw your attention away from the important part of that conversation by focusing on the fact that she used a cuss word when referring to the EU. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Sari and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Sari could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. The U.S. government thought that they could control this beast, but they were wrong. Foboda and the right sector are not toys to be played with. These groups are armed, they're forceful, and they view this crisis as an opportunity to reshape Ukraine in their own image. This video shows a prominent leader from the right sector, Alexander Muzichko, brandishing an AK-47 in Parliament, letting them know who's in charge. This is the same Alexander Muzichko who's made public statements in the past vowing to, quote, fight against Jews, communists, and Russian scum for as long as he lives. As long as I live, I will fight against Jews, communists, and Russian scum. Apparently, the U.S. government has been a little slow to catch on to the fact that their hand has been exposed. In March, a senior U.S. official told Reuters that, quote, Since entering the Ukrainian parliament in October of 2012, the Swoboda leadership has been working to take their party in a more moderate direction and to become a modern European mainstream political party. The leadership has been much more vigilant about expelling or otherwise punishing individual members who engage in xenophobic behavior or rhetoric. Oh, so it's okay to use no neo-Nazi groups to topple a government as long as their leaders keep their people from saying anything stupid in front of cameras for a few months. The reality of the matter is that, as ridiculous as this position makes Washington look, they're trapped. They can't deny that Svoboda and right sector are running the coalition government when Svoboda holds five senior posts, including the deputy prime minister position. And the right sector's Dmitry Yarosh is now the country's deputy secretary of national security. But what about that dramatic video, I Am Ukrainian, that went viral as the crisis was unfolding? It was so compelling, so heart-wrenching. Yeah, but who made it? A whisper to a roar. Who are these people? Oh look, a link in the description. Let's click it. They have a website and a behind-the-scenes section. Oh, it lists the filmmakers. Who's this here? Larry Diamond, inspiration and executive producer. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Endowment for Democracy. And he's an advisor for the U.S. State Department. You know the funny thing about the National Endowment for Regime Change, I mean, um, democracy, is that even though they call themselves an NGO, they get virtually all of their money from the U.S. federal government. You can easily verify this by downloading their annual financial disclosures. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that the NED has been pouring massive amounts of money into Ukraine to, quote, strengthen democracy and civil society. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Democracy, civil society. Of course, by now you've realized that when they talk about spreading democracy, what they really mean is regime change. And they are willing to work with the most despicable elements when it's expedient. This is exactly the same game as they played in Syria. The U.S. government funded known extremists, literal terrorist organizations who have been documented massacring whole towns. And even after those extremists used sarin gas on thousands of civilians and got caught by the UN, Washington still covered for them. Even to this day, they are still funding those murderers. They are still training them. And they are still sending them weapons. There's a word for that. State-backed terrorism. But the situation in Ukraine didn't unfold as planned. The Parliament of Crimea in the south of Ukraine voted to secede. And they're putting the decision up for a public referendum on March 16th. The U.S. government claims that this referendum is unconstitutional and says that they won't recognize Crimea's decision as legitimate regardless of the outcome. So a foreign-backed neo-Nazi coup which takes control of a government without a vote is constitutional, but a declaration of independence placed to a general vote is not? Seriously, that's the best you guys can do? Who writes these scripts? Take a step back and look at the pattern. The real stakes of this drama are much bigger than Ukraine or Syria. And these are not random or isolated events. We are witnessing the final stages of a geopolitical chess game that is designed to end in war. But in order to get that war, they need to convince you, the public, that they didn't see this coming. They need you to believe that the other side was the aggressor. They're counting on you not paying attention to the fact that Obama signed an order targeting Russia with sanctions this past week and revoking the visas of a number of Russian diplomats. They're counting on you not noticing that Russia had warned that such a move would result in Russia dropping the dollar and encouraging others to do so as well. Oh, and did I mention that China is on Russia's side in this conflict? The same China who keeps our economy afloat by loaning us more and more money. That's a brilliant idea. 
start an economic war with China. These people are counting on you to be too naive to realize that economic warfare invites physical warfare. They're playing chicken with your children's future, and they think you're too stupid to connect the dots. Prove them wrong. We highly recommend that you verify the information presented here for yourself. In the description, you'll find a link to a page on our website which lists all of our sources. If you'd like to keep up with what's really going on in the world, go to our website, scgnews.com, and sign up for email updates. If you sign up for these updates, you'll get notified of any new articles or videos that we put out. And this is important because we're able to put out a lot more content covering a lot more topics in article format than we are in video. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus by searching for Storm Clouds Gathering or SCG News. For Ukrainian nationalists, January 1st is one of the most important days in their calendar. It marks the birth of Stepan Bandera, the leader of the Ukrainian partisan forces during the Second World War. The rally was organized by the far-right Svoboda Party. Protesters marched amidst a river of torches and signs saying, Ukraine above all else. But for many in Ukraine and abroad, Bandera's legacy is controversial. His group, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, sided with Nazi German forces before breaking with them later in the war. Western historians also say that his followers carried out massacres of Polish and Jewish civilians. But for many of his supporters, he is a symbol of Ukraine's struggle for independence. This year is the 105th anniversary of his birthday. Every year since 2006, Svoboda marches on the 1st of January in memory of him and to spread his ideas. The ideas are very simple, to leave it an independent country where Ukrainians will be the owners of their motherland. The Svoboda party itself is also highly controversial. It has played a major role in the country's pro-European, anti-government protests, now more than a month old. Ukraine is a deeply divided country, however, and many in its east and south consider the party to be extremist. Many observers say that rallies like today's torchlight march only add to this division. David Stern, BBC News, Kiev. Нацизм-это-плохо-это-неправда. Why is the news supposed to take secrecy? Okay, uh, well, I studied in college and lots of people uh, there in control of college are Jewish and they won't like what, I'm, what I'll be saying. Who are skinheads? This is the national identity of the national community in a certain social society. Our ideology is the first thing to say that for us, Ukraine is the first thing to say. For the progress of the white race. Потому что наша раса вообще, ну, славянская, европеоидная раса на грани вымирания. Что мы занимаемся, во-первых, пропагандой как таковой, которую социальное общество не воспринимает как таковую. Пропаганду заполнения нашей страны иммигрантами, евреями, которые сейчас сидят, в принципе, в государственных властях как таковые. This country is run by Jews, is run by banks, and banks are run by Jews, and lots of our politicians are Jewish, and mayor of our city is Jewish too. Он брат по крови, я с ним вот так вот здороваюсь. То есть по вене, то есть вот здесь вот вены, вот так вот по вене здороваюсь. Кто это придумал, я не знаю. Но скинхеды так здороваются. Так делают только ультраправые скинхеды.
Ну, это тот скинхед, который действительно борется, который чем что-то делает для своей страны. Брить голову на лысо, да не обязательно, потому что, ну... Намек? Нет. Первоначально, когда я только начинал этим заниматься, да, я забривался на лысо, носил тяжелые ботинки, куртку, бомбер. А потом просто, ну, например, даже пример приведу такой, и буду идти я по улице и убью какого-нибудь черного или там, или узкоглазого, или того же жида, или антифашиста, коммуниста, например. И чтобы потеряться в толпе, если я буду лысый и в больших ботинках с подкатами, с подтяжками спущенными, то, понятное дело, что менты сразу же меня обратят внимание и меня заберут. А если я в таком, в таком виде буду идти, я просто смешаюсь с толпой и свободно смогу уйти. И то и повторите такие же акции еще не, не один раз. Когда их забьют банда бритых там на подтягах, в ботинках, они будут знать, что их избили в скинхеды. А когда их вот изобьют вот такие люди, вот волосатые, без ботинков, они не будут знать, что это кто, кто они такие. Они будут думать, что это просто их избили простые люди. As Ukraine's new leadership struggles to form an interim government, right-wing hardliners are placing themselves at the core of the reforms. That's stoking fears of a rise in neo-Nazism, with a synagogue, be synagogue being torched in the country's west. In one of the main violent incidents, RT's Alexei Yeroshevsky has more. We lead Ukraine's and Europe's biggest battle. In a vibrantly edited clip, the right sector movement of Ukraine states its mission. And while something that revolution here ended with the ousting of President Yanukovych, its leader Dmitry Yarosh has a different view. This is just the beginning. Ukraine's resurrection, Europe's resurrection, they start at our Maidan. But does this resurrection require the storming of political party offices, the torching of politicians' houses, and the manhunt for journalists? Recently, they offered a reward for the whereabouts of a Russian journalist from the RTR channel for what they call providing false information, so you can see where we are heading now. The Jewish community in Zaporozhye in southeastern Ukraine thought calm had returned. But on Tuesday, an identified man tried to set the town's synagogue ablaze with Molotov cocktails. Four masked men started throwing explosives at our synagogue at around 11 p.m. Our security tried to catch the perpetrators, but they failed. The right sector is the core and the voice of the uprising, but the extent of its involvement in the acts of vandalism and violence rocking Ukraine now is hard to verify. The attacks are often perpetrated by unidentified masked men. Finding who exactly they represent is difficult. The word on the street is that there are several armed factions operating under the Maidan banner now, raising serious concerns about the rise of extremism just as the symbols of the tragic past resurface on Ukraine's streets. We witness right now um, a very hypocritic approach to politics, especially by the European Union and by the European states. They say they fight against extremism inside the European Union. They fund extremism and support extremism outside the European Union. Despite what is widely seen as a victory over the regime, the Maidan remains intact, with the right sector standing firm. Some of its members may leave Independence Square soon though, possibly landing jobs in the revamped Interior Ministry, when Parliament forms a unity government on Thursday. Alexei Roshevsky RT, reporting from Kiev in Ukraine. Now, the mass unrest in Ukraine seems to have made the country a popular destination for U.S. diplomats, with the latest State Department official now in Kiev. Victoria Nuland plans to meet with both the leadership and the opposition to offer Washington support in putting together a new government. As Marina Portnaya now reports, this follows a long tradition of U.S. involvement in the politics of other nations. 
In less than two months, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland is making her second visit to Ukraine, where anti-government protesters have received the full support and backing of Washington. Now, U.S. officials say this trip is aimed towards aiding the country in forming a new government and helping Ukrainians fulfill their democratic aspirations. Now, back in December, it was the stomachs of protesters that Ms. Nuland helped fill as she walked around Kyiv's Independence Square handing out snacks. Now, for many, this scene put an entirely new twist on international meddling. You see, in recent years, the U.S. has cemented its reputation in siding with anti-government opposition movements, taking place in sovereign countries such as Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria. But in the case of Ukraine, U.S. officials are actually flying over the Atlantic to visit and possibly strategize with pro-European Union protesters, a power play that critics say Washington would condemn if the roles were reversed. If uh, China or Russia or any other great power uh, or even a regional power like Iran uh, came to the U.S. and and, um, was encouraging the protesters, uh, there would be a hue and cry from the American media uh, like you'd never hear it before, they would say, why are these people interfering in our internal affairs? But of course, the United States uh, sort of has a double standard because it often interferes in the affairs of other countries and thinks uh, nothing about it. In all fairness, critics say the U.S. does sometimes show restraint when it comes to foreign conflicts. For example, in Bahrain, as brutal and deadly crackdowns against peaceful unarmed protesters have taken place, the U.S. has minded its own business. America has also respected its right to remain silent as Saudi Arabia recently enacted a new law allowing the kingdom to prosecute and jail anyone who exposes corruption or demands reform. Reporting from New York, Marina Portnaya, RT. We are the independents. Last night we asked John Bolton what he'd do in North Korea if he were president. And we want to pose the same scenario for Ukraine, whose unrest is growing deadlier by the day. Joining us is former congressman and two-time presidential hopeful, Dr. Ron Paul. Good evening, Dr. Paul. Good evening. Nice to be with you. Very good. Well, a lot is happening around the globe, from Syria to Venezuela, and especially in the Ukraine. How would President Paul respond to the uprising? Which one? You want in Ukraine in particular? Ukraine. Let's start with Ukraine. Okay. Uh, I I think we should just stay out of it. Uh, The Ukrainians have a problem. It's a serious problem. And many Ukrainians take the position that uh, they should be allowed to settle that problem and no foreign government should be involved. Unfortunately, the people who are more powerful in the East, the ones who are more powerful in the West, want help. One uh, seeks the United States to get money and support and the other one seeks Russia. So it's a mess. But one thing for sure, The only thing we have a control of and an American president would have control of is to mind our own business. Unfortunately, we have done exactly the opposite where there was a conversation caught between the Assistant Secretary of State and our ambassador to Ukraine planning strategy on how to take over the country and who's going to be the leader of the country in the future. That, that is not good. That is very bad. It won't solve the problems. It will just dig another quagmire for us, and it won't help the Ukrainians. And I, I know you're opposed to nation building, but at some point, do you pick up, on the, the, do you pick up the phone? When does uh, your version of diplomacy begin? Well, oh, the phone, I, I think you should always have diplomacy. Anybody who's willing to talk, uh, we should talk. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should badger, that we shouldn't promise to give away taxpayers' money. We shouldn't threaten with bombing. But to talk to people is, is quite all right, and I think it should be. I think talking to the Iranians okay. Kennedy talked to Khrushchev in a very critical period in our history. So talking is very good. We should do a lot more. We have thousands of diplomats. <laughs> I wish we would use a few of them once in a while. So talking is one thing, but getting involved and in claiming that we have a moral right and an obligation to settle these disputes. Uh, I think that uh, the Ukrainians uh, are obligated to settle their own disputes, just as if we have a dispute in this country, uh, we don't want the Chinese or the Russians or the the Europeans coming here and telling us how to settle a dispute in our country or on our borders. What do you do even rhetorically when you have a disproportionate 
uh, exercise of power. In the case of Russia, all around its periphery, it's been meddling in the affairs of Ukraine right now and has so much more power than Ukraine does. Certainly meddled in the affairs of Georgia and Abkhazia and plenty of places like that. Do you at least use the bully pulpit or, uh, uh, I mean, do you criticize them for doing this? What do you do when there's, a, when there's an imbalance of power between two states and one of them is, is, is pushing the other one around? Well, of course, you could throw that question back to America because look at how many places you take the Iranians right now. We must have 50 bases around the Iranians and nuclear missiles surrounding them. So, yes, that happens, but I'm, I'm just opposed to it because I think it makes it much worse. But for an arguing the case that uh, us being in the Ukraine is identical to the Soviets or the Russians being in Ukraine would be like arguing that uh, if there's a border dispute with Mexico and the the Russians are in there agitating that that wouldn't be of greater interest to us uh, than uh, it should be to to the Russians and uh, right now uh, you know historically the Russians are involved the Europeans are involved but to let them settle it uh, why are we going thousands and thousands of miles away looking for a fight and looking for further financing with money we don't have uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't set examples and if somebody asks us a question about what could be done, I think separ you know, if somebody says, what's your advice? Well, make two states out of there, have a loose confederation, let the east go east and the west go west and uh, all of a sudden maybe it would end. I believe that there should be, uh, you know, I, 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 I believe in self-determination, I believe in small government uh, and I think the people would believe that way. But if you took a poll in east and west, uh, half would want to go one way and half the other way, but it's the leaders, it's the government, it's the special interests, it's the Russian government and the American government that gets in there and agitates for the wrong reason. But just for the people, I believe they could make, you know, a decision for themselves. But uh, I heard just recently somebody speaking from, uh, from the Ukraine and said, yes, we have a problem, we can deal with it. The last thing we need is foreign intervention. We'd like the Americans to stay out and we'd like the Russians to stay out. And of course that would be a much better situation. But uh, to say that uh, the Russian involvement there is identical to ours, I don't agree with that uh, because of the analogy I made with Mexico. Now Putin's a little busy with the Olympics this week. We'll see what happens next. All right, Dr. In place of the defiant speeches, the somber strains of Beethoven now ring out over Independence Square. This revolution is moving into a new phase. But amidst the flowers and the children's tributes, flashes of something more sinister. Groups of armed men strut through the square with dubious iconography. That yellow armband is a Volksangel, a German symbol used by several SS divisions during the Second World War. Far-right graffiti is appearing, daubed on the walls of the city. The people who brought down the government were overwhelmingly ordinary Ukrainians, students and doctors, workers and even families, people who simply refused to back down. But the most organized and perhaps the most effective were a small number of far-right groups. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the loudest and the most violent. A group calling itself the Right Sector is perhaps the largest. Its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. Sometimes they carry guns. We met these men posing for pictures outside the burnt-out remains of what was once their headquarters. I asked them about their political beliefs. Yeah. 
Но не у всех это, это не заложено в основе этой организации. Это у некоторых людей есть. А у вас? У меня лично есть. В смысле, объясните. Ну, мне как бы нравится эта идея единой нации. Я, я хочу, чтобы ну, нация была единой, я, чтобы э, один народ, одна страна, одна нация. А это подразумевается что? что? Ну, как бы, чтобы чистая нация. Ну, не то, что там, как бы у Гитлера как было, но в своем роде немножко, ну, маленько, но было, чтобы своя нация. What about the East, I asked? What about Crimea? Where many Ukrainians feel close historical ties to Russia. Кто кому нравится Россия, пусть едут в Россию. Украина будет только для украинцев. Police have largely disappeared from the streets of Kiev. Law and order is maintained by so-called self-defense groups. Not all hold extreme views, but those who do are often shy of the cameras. We got a late-night phone call from another group known as C-14, inviting us to meet their leader at their new base. It turned out to be the former headquarters of the Communist Party, now occupied by the far right. It's our general mission to totally ruin uh, chains that connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And that being Russia? Yes, we can do Russia, not only Russia, so Soviet Union. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi, I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. And what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic, some political forces. And, uh, Which ethnic groups? Uh, 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 Russians and Jews and the Poles, it may be uh, every, some uh, non-Ukrainian group control a huge percent of some economic or political uh, power. And uh, uh, of course in this situation uh, Ukrainian people have uh, some uh, tension between it and it causes uh, conflicts. Mr. Karas says his group consists of around 200 men. C-14 is affiliated with a political party called Svoboda or Freedom which now controls four ministries in the new government, including the Ministry of Defence. Two of its MPs were recently photographed brandishing well-known far-right numerology. 88 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet, HH, Heil Hitler. We, as Soboda, in, no, in no way espouse Nazi, Nazism. In fact, we fight against Nazism. For us, Nazism and Communism are uh, two sides of the same uh, coin. Uh, those are both uh, totalitarian ideologies which uh, destroyed uh, the Ukrainian nation in the 20th century and fought against Ukrainians and uh, killed millions of Ukrainians. The fervor of the revolution is beginning to fade now. People are starting to move on. But it's clear that it was the radical groups who kept up the pressure on Viktor Yanukovych and many of them feel that this really is their victory. The question is, how much power will that give the far right in the new Ukraine? Ukrainian politics is in a state of flux. Different groups are jostling for position. Left-wing activists have also taken control of some government buildings, but it's the right that appears to be coming out on top. Uh, when the fighting started, they started to attract more and more young people, and, and then not only young people, but all kinds of, of persons. Where they were marginal, regarded as marginal, previously now they are seen as being at the core of, of the protest, and therefore at the core of those who now have a popular legitimacy to make decisions. With their anti-Russian rhetoric, events in Crimea will almost certainly play into the hands of the nationalists. No one knows exactly how strong they are in terms of numbers, but the influence of the far right in Ukraine is growing. Dmitry Yarosh made a name for himself as a leading figure in the recent Ukrainian uprising that took place in Kiev. And now, as a representative of the far-right movement, he has announced his presidential bid in the elections that are planned to take place on May 25th. For a closer look at the country's next potential president, here's RT's Peter Oliver.
Dmitry Yarosh is the leader of the group right sector. You can't really move around the central part of Kiev right now without seeing uh, somebody bearing the insignia of his organization. In some circles, they're called neo-Nazis. They are certainly far right. They are certainly ultra-nationalist. Ultra now, we're also hearing from the um, inside the security services here in Ukraine that right sector have put forward demands suggesting they must have access to arms and military hardware. If they don't receive those weapons and hardware, well, perhaps they could try and, and influence um, the, the government elsewhere in order to try and obtain them. The man himself who is putting himself forward for president, Dmitry Yarosh, now he is the, the subject of an international warrant that was issued by Russia on the charges of inciting terror attacks and extremist actions. Now, they aren't the only strongly nationalist group operating here in Ukraine right now. We have seen footage um, of a, an armoured personnel carrier driving through the streets of Ukraine bearing the flag of the Ukrainian Patriotic Army. Now that's an organisation and in Ukraine's history has been involved in a number of far-right and ultra-nationalist attacks. So Dmitry Yarosh's group, the right sector, aren't the only ones but they're certainly the ones that seem to be um, pushing for power here in Kiev right now. That was RT's Peter Oliver reporting. In the former Soviet Republic, Ukraine, controversial video has surfaced showing the reburial of Ukrainians who fought for an SS division during World War II. And the reburial was sanctioned by church officials and overseen by officials dressed in Nazi uniforms. Ethnic Ukrainian nationalists wore helmets with swastikas and uniforms marked with Third Reich eagles during the service for 16 members of the SS Division Galicia. The ceremony took place in the village of Holohori in Ukraine's western Lviv province. Some veterans were present. During a salute over the grave, costumed reenactors used wartime era rifles to fire a salute as their leader gave commands in German. Priests looked on, and later in the ceremony, Oleg Pankevich, a member of parliament for the political party Svoboda, which has a faction in parliament, called on Ukrainians to stand up as a nation and to resist outside oppression. The SS division Galicia is controversial in Ukraine because it was drawn from the west of the country, which is mainly populated by ethnic Ukrainians, many of whose grandfathers fought on the side of Germany during World War II. The east and the south of Ukraine is heavily Russian-speaking, and during World War II both ethnic Russians and Ukrainians from those regions fought in the Red Army for the Soviet Union. And that is why wartime loyalty remains a political flashpoint in modern Ukraine. Svoboda, which means freedom in Ukrainian, is led by the nationalist politician Oleg Tiny Bok. The group has seen increasing popularity in recent years with a political platform of proud Ukrainian nationalism and an end to Soviet-style leadership, crony capitalism and political corruption. But Svoboda has drawn fire for an alleged unwillingness to admit ethnic Russians and other non-Ukrainian nationalities into its ranks, and for anti-Semitic comments by some of its functionaries. The party has also been criticized for strong-arm tactics, as shown here when Svoboda activists fought with police to break into a Kiev city council meeting they had been locked out of. This was the flag of the slave-holding states in the United States that seceded in 1861, causing civil war. Today, the symbol is used by the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazi groups, and other organizations who are hostile to African Americans. For the last several decades, protests have continued, demanding that this flag not be displayed in public places. Many people were disturbed to see that the Confederate flag was being displayed, not in the United States, but in Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine. Larry Holmes, a civil rights activist in New York City, explained why the flag is so offensive. For black people, it's no different than having the Nazi flag, the swastika, hanging in, uh, uh, in Parliament or in some important government building. After Kiev was seized by U.S.-backed anti-Russia protesters, the Confederate flag was displayed in City Hall. Holmes says this caused him to be very concerned about the new regime. If uh, you're confused, about the political uh, nature of at least some of those who are involved in this coup. Well, this flag gives you a good sense of who they are.
Holmes is very concerned about the nature of the new U.S.-backed government in Ukraine, which includes leaders who openly admire former German dictator Adolf Hitler. What is the view behind those who are holding up these symbols? What is their political direction? Uh, it, it has to be a nightmare. It has to be racist. It has to be something that is dangerous and something that is feared and something that good will people must unite against. In the region of Crimea, much of the population has rejected the new government. Sections of the army have defected to form self-defense units. It is unclear what will happen next as violence and instability continue in Ukraine. Caleb Maupin, Press TV, New York. The threat of neo-Nazi ideology is causing alarm in Ukraine. And the country, home to over 13 ethnicities, is now rocked on a daily basis by shocking videos uploaded to YouTube by some of those who came to power following the ousting of President Yanukovych. RT's Maria Fanoshna filed this report. These are some of the new masters of Ukraine, doing what they want after spearheading the revolution. They burst into a local parliament session in a town outside Kiev, wearing uniforms, masks and t-shirts with Nazi symbols. <laughs> Among them are the Patriots of Ukraine group. One of its leaders, Igor Moseychuk, was recently released from jail as a political prisoner by the country's new authorities. He had been serving six years for preparing a terror attack. Any attempts to infringe on Ukraine's territorial integrity will be punished. If the authorities can't do that, we'll handle it. We'll go to the Crimea, and like before, they'll run like rats. While there is evidence that his fighters train with firearms. A close associate of the Patriots of Ukraine, Dmitry Yarosh, was reportedly offered a key position in the Ukrainian Security Council. His group, the right sector, has been described as neo-fascist by the Western media. Another prominent member, Alexander Muzichko, in this 2007 video pledges to fight against communists, Jews and Russians for as long as blood flows in his veins. It's a sentiment echoed by his followers in this video. Stab the Russian scum! Veterans know what fascism is. There were the Nuremberg trials that recognized it as evil, but still we see it being supported and glorified. Vasily Lobov, the head of an Air Force Veterans Association, is one of many Ukrainians who are worried about the rise of these radicals. We met Vasily in Sevastopol, the Crimean city that witnessed some of the bloodiest fighting against the Nazis in World War II. There are certain circles abroad who are not interested in a strong Ukraine. They do not want to see Russia and Ukraine work together. They want to sow division between us. This is a World War II memorial in Sevastopol, the city that earned its military glory in the fight against fascism. It commemorates those who died trying to protect their motherland and their families from a sick ideology that threatened to take this region and the world over. Today, almost 70 years later, it seems the principles and values these brave people fought for could again be in danger while the force they died fighting may be making a comeback. Marie Fnoshina, RT from Crimea. Well, I, look, uh, obviously Putin has his mission and he clearly does see himself in the way that Professor Cohen just outlined. But here's the thing, you know, obviously there's been, uh, you know, a major sort of argument over Ukraine. But Putin and the Russians have by treaty their big Black Sea fleet in Sebastopol in the Crimea. Uh, there was no indication that the new Ukrainian government uh, was going to change that reality at all. And you say that Putin has telegraphed, you know, what his aims are and that he's not a thug. Well, look, I would like you to explain to me how he and us can justify 
the trumping up of this hysteria in the Crimea, which has given the Russians the ability to do what they're doing, whether it was well, the trumped up change of government in the, in the Crimean parliament, whether it was the trumped up call by this government for uh, Russians right. to come in and protect them when they were not being killed, Professor Cohen, there was no violence in the Crimea, whether it was the horrendous, and I've done a lot of reporting on hate speech and nationalistic speech and on incitement to war and hatred and the uh, state Russian media is very bad ahead, right Professor now Kong. on this. No, no, this is the facts. And now you have the Duma uh, debating right. an annexation law. All of this is trumped up to provide Putin with what you say, and that is his uh, desire to, to protect their interests and to keep his sphere of influence. Yeah. Professor Cohen. The extremism didn't come from Russia. It was coming from Western Ukraine. We've left a large part of the story out. There's a small but resolute and determined right-wing nationalist movement in Ukraine. It's quasi-fascist, and it is dictating terms to this parliament in Kiev, which is not legitimate in law, international, or constitutional. This parliament, which is a rump parliament because they banned the two majority parties that represented the East, have been passing anti-Russian uh, legislation. They banned the use of Russian as an official language. It isn't Russia that's been spewing this ideological destabilizing uh, message. It's been coming from the West. And here the worst part is, that has been. That hatred has been supported by Washington and Brussels in embracing this West Ukrainian movement. That, will, that must stop. We're up against the clock, uh, unfortunately, but uh, to be continued. An excellent conversation, uh, Professor Cohen. Christiana Amanpour, thanks very much. And on that last point, you heard Vitaly Cherkin, the Russian ambassador to the UN Security Council, saying earlier today that at, at fault for all of this are what he called fascists and anti-Semites in Ukraine right now. To be you continued. know, you've got to be really careful putting that across as a, as a fact. That's what Vitaly Cherkin. He that, may have done. That's what he but said. That is the Russian position. He may have that's done. That's what I was but pointing out. But are you out. telling me? Are you saying that the entire pro-European, of course not. You Ukrainians or anti-Semites, that is what Christian, the Russians I'm are saying. I'm only saying what Vitaly Cherkin, that's Churkin, what the Russians are he saying, said, and that's what Professor, Professor Cohen is saying. Professor Cohen say it, and I was just pointing out that a Russian right. official at the United Nations today <laughs> said, "What's it? What? who's responsible for all of this fascists and anti-Semites in Ukraine? Am I saying right. that? No, I'm not. But I am saying that that's what Vitaly Cherkin said. Right, and, and we have to be right. very careful. We'll play it for you. We played it not for you to, earlier. No, no, I hour. heard it. Yeah. I heard it. We just, as a network, have to be really careful not to lump the entire pro-European Ukrainians into what we're some not. may I'm well not. be, which are nationalistic we're, and, uh, and, and, and extremist. Christian, so that's what not, I'm saying. Not, hey, guys, not, I'm an outsider. I, I hate all. to see a civil war break out it's on not a CNN. Civil war. <laughs> Jest, okay, so calm down. Okay. So say you were elected president, all right, and you're in the exact same position that Barack Obama's in right now. Putin rolls into the Crimea, violating international law. What do you do? What I do is not have USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy working with U.S. taxpayers' money to knock off an elected government in Ukraine, which is what they did. I wouldn't try to force the people of Ukraine into a deal with NATO against their interests or into a deal with right, so the European Union, fault which is that against Putin their economic interests. So it's the USA's fault that Putin rolled in? We made no, him do you it? Have to, Bill O'Reilly, if you don't believe in cause and effect, I don't know what I can do for you. All right, I'm just asking you, matter, is, is, it, is it America was at fault? Here. Is it, did America provoke Putin to roll into the Crimea, in your opinion? Well, you have to look at what happened. The U.S. has been involved covertly and behind the scenes with the CIA, with the National Endowment for Democracy, and USAID to stir up trouble in Ukraine. All right. Now so you've we got neo-Nazis. So the United States caused this mess. Putin was right to go into Crimea, violate international law. Is he right to take over the whole country and kind of annex of it toward the Moscow? Not. That's, not, that's not going to happen. And of course that wouldn't be right. You know, Crimea is okay. Support, look, Crimea is okay. We should be concerned about the, con the con we should be concerned about the Ukrainian people because they're being used right now. They would be used by the IMF in a new austerity program, by NATO to go on the doorstep of Do Russia. Do you think the Ukrainian people would be better off under Putin's heel or in the EU? The people of Ukraine 
have to make that decision. And they did. Ukraine, they, 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 they deposed, Ukraine, they deposed the Russia, puppet leader the and they States. threw him out. They made the decision. Well, wait a minute. That wasn't democratic. That was stirred up oh, from behind the scenes. Democratic. I mean, it wasn't, I mean it wasn't democratic. the president who was elected democratically then suspended many, many democratic, like the right of assembly. I mean, all right, look, mm -hmm. I don't want to get involved in Ukrainian politics. I don't think that's well, what we, we need to do here. And we shouldn't be. All right. So you're blaming us for it. I, I, that's no, a pretty I'm interesting point of view. You have to look at the United States behind the scenes efforts in Ukraine to understand right. what's going on. When, 65 when China, programs supported by I, I the go. National Endowment for Democracy. I'm Groups meant to bring peace are running the scams that start war. Coming up. NGOs accused of the hoaxes pushing Ukraine to war. Former Amnesty board member warns all human rights groups have been infiltrated. And CNN buys the latest State Department scam. Ukrainian, the native of Kiev. This viral video, hyped by the mainstream, is the latest exposed as a State Department hoax, the opposite of the stated, quote, grassroots expression by Ukrainians. It's actually by a California firm and produced by a man called Larry Diamond of the US State Department and its NGO, the National Endowment for Democracy. The video is designed, notes activist post, to con the public to back more foreign intervention by associating Ukraine's shockingly violent coup with some peaceful, fragrant girl called Julia instead of Nazi insurgents who've murdered their way to power or Assistant State Secretary Vic Newland caught revealing she'd plotted this coup against the elected government long before the protests started. Investigative reporter Paul Joseph Watson notes CNN's Anderson Cooper for some reasons often the point man for these State Department hoaxes. Paul joins us. Great to speak to you. What's going on? So you can look at the example of Anderson Cooper. He sold the Coney 2012 scam, which was similar to this I am a Ukrainian scam. And he quickly had to abandon that once it became obvious that that was a, a contrived agenda to justify US military intervention in Africa. And then even after that, he sold the Syria Danny scam, which was this situation involving a, a quote, Syrian activist who was in fact staging YouTube videos to blame atrocities on the Assad regime as a means of discrediting, demonizing the Syrian government and justifying US military intervention. And what's interesting is the mainstream media interviews of Yulia that have occurred over the past couple of weeks credit her with being the creator of the video when in fact it was created by a production company linked directly to the US State Department. So the key man behind the video, according to the production company itself, was Larry Diamond. Larry Diamond's National Endowment for Democracy is funding at least dozens of Ukrainian groups they simply dub, quote, pro-democracy and human rights. In fact, these groups' websites call for assassination of political opponents. As one headline reads, he needs to be killed. Rioters have been handed out these instructions by a State Department-funded NGO called Canvas. Canvas made identical flyers in Arabic for US-backed protests in Egypt. In fact, instructions with the NGO's FIST logo have been distributed wherever countries resist takeover by Wall Street. They are going in every place since the end of the Cold War to destabilize regimes which offer resistance to this larger agenda, the globalization agenda, as Washington defines it. NGOs pay protesters $35 to turn up, notes the Foreign Policy Journal, rising to hundreds for violence. This protest organizer admitted how much US NGOs paid him and their real target. One million bucks. One million dollars? Yeah. Some smaller country like Belarus, for instance, or Ukraine, and then we can get Russia. 
We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals. They're doing so peacefully, with great courage, and with enormous personal restraint. As they sang hymns and prayed for peace, as we take Ukraine into the future that it deserves. This future it deserves, reports European Tribune, was arranged even before protests started. Leaked images show NATO teaching Ukraine's neo-Nazi gangs, here wearing a Nazi hat, quote, terrorism and subversion, how to use radio-controlled mines, sniper rifles in civilian areas, and spreading human rights and democracy. When they seized power last week, they began spraying swastikas and defacing synagogues with the words death to the Jews, but using a more offensive word than Jews. The book Ideal Illusions, how the US government co-opted human rights, found a State Department meeting chose the terms human rights and democracy as its perfect foil. Such broad terms could justify attacking anyone, while Hollywood and media paint US as the model despite by far the world's largest prison population and far and away the world's most appalling war crimes, including the murder of millions in Iraq. Real or invented offences in target nations would be presented as symptomatic and requiring regime change, whereas far worse American violations are just, quote, mistakes. In fact, the very term human rights group, notes the site Global Research, couldn't be more false. Each US bombing campaign is not just supported by NGOs, they have been the very instigators of the scams that push decision makers to destroy human rights and human lives around the world. Over 70 leading NGOs claim Gaddafi murdered 6,000 in Benghazi, the claim on which the UN approved intervention. After the war, where NATO killed even more people than the claimed attack, NGOs admitted it wasn't true. One of those signatories was Human Rights Watch, which told Obama to continue rendition, the practice of flying people to third-party states to strip them of rights. The group claims the UN blamed the Ghouta chemical attack on Syria's government. It was not even in the UN mandate to apport blame, and also regrets the US hasn't bombed Damascus on the grounds that it fails to ensure justice. Justice for Human Rights Watch notes Ron Paul Institute's Daniel McAdams means NATO killing far more people than even the alleged attack. Daniel joins us. Great to see you. Why are human rights groups behaving like this? Well, you know what? Human Rights Watch is kind of a pseudo-private intelligence agency. Uh, they often have people on the ground first, uh, and they are able to dominate the media coverage of an event. Uh, they can inflate figures, they can deflate figures, depending on the position of U.S. foreign policy. This uh, human rights organization uh, that started, that's, that issued a report about uh, Gaddafi was using jet planes to kill people and he had killed 6,000. It was repeated the same way as gospel, as gospel. And then a very, a very good French filmmaker named Julien Taylor made a film where he interviewed the individual who was responsible for writing that report, a Libyan citizen, and they asked him, well, where was the proof for your, for your assertions? And he he just looked at the camera and said, there is no proof. There is no proof. What can I tell you? There is none. In what human rights investigations called a scandal of the first order, the state official who took NGO's Libyan hoax to the UN was rewarded with the chair of Amnesty USA. Suzanne Nussel promptly made one of Amnesty's big four campaigns a celebration of NATO bombing Afghanistan with the catchphrase, NATO keeps the progress going. Twelve years of Afghan war has been a disaster. The UN's relief chief warns increasingly men and women can't even feed themselves, let alone any other rights. Political activist Eric Dreitzer joins us. Great to speak to you. What's going on? Look at some of America's wars to understand the way in which Amnesty International functions as a propaganda mouthpiece. If you look at the Amnesty International campaign with regard to Afghanistan, what do they put front and center? The rights of women, 
by putting it out there in that fashion, they are acting to sell the war, the continued occupation of Afghanistan to the American people, using the face of young Afghan women to justify what is a nakedly imperial war. This is the sad truth of what Amnesty International does, that Amnesty International, like the other NGOs, act as an appendage of the United States foreign policy. They act as an appendage of finance capital. Congress authorized the first Gulf War by just five votes. Four of those members said they backed it due to an amnesty report rushed through just before that claimed Iraq soldiers were pulling babies off life support machines. Once war had been approved, amnesty admitted it was a lie. The resulting invasion was a, quote, indiscriminate massacre of hundreds of thousands of civilians and soldiers, including a four-hour slaughter of thousands of defenseless fleeing people. One US pilot admitted was like shooting fish in a barrel. Amnesty board member Francis Boyle resigned after hitting a wall of silence on any approach to US, British or Israeli war crimes. He joins us now. Great to see you. Can you give us a view from inside the organization? Uh, I was involved in trying to prevent the, uh, their publication of that dead babies report uh, on Iraq that was so uh, warmongering. Uh, I couldn't do it. Certainly, uh, Amnesty works as uh, an adjunct to the uh, State Department, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which tries to make it appear as if they're the uh, high holy priesthood of uh, human rights movements. The uh, ex-CIA agent uh, Ralph McGee, he established they were penetrated by uh, the CIA. Uh, I myself uh, found them uh, 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 ferrying uh, guerrillas uh, in then uh, South Sudan to work the, against the uh, government of Sudan. I sent them a day march. They never uh, bothered to respond. Likewise, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, again, Ralph McGee, uh, uh, proving that they were pen penetrated by uh, uh, French intelligence agents. So uh, I think it's fair to say that's true for, uh, for all of them. Yes, yeah, so what can nations do when they're targeted by these NGOs? Uh, they should be expelled, yes, because they're, they're basically an arm of the United States government. So Ned should be expelled and the uh, Republican Institute, which is uh, also the Republican Party, they should be expelled too. You, you can't have agents of foreign governments uh, running around promoting coup d'etats and things of that nature. And the same with USAID. They, they should be thrown out too. We would never tolerate that here in the United States, except when it comes to the uh, Israel lobby. When the State Department came up with its plan for human rights NGOs in the 80s, historian James Peck notes the idea was they'd occasionally offer some toothless criticism of US policy so the public would think they're fair. Today, they've given up any pretense of balance, cheering on violent neo-Nazis in Ukraine while simply fabricating lies and false provocations against US targets. If history is any guide, NGOs will do everything to turn Ukraine into international war. When the organizations tasked with preventing conflict are the ones provoking it, the world is in a dangerous place. Seek truth from facts. This is The Truth Seeker.